text that we've been reading and uh, all that, it, it will form the basis of our study for today. Well, quickly, we could go into the text and then, uh, yeah, find our study for the day. Uh, Revelation 10, 11 says, You said unto me, thou must prophesy again. And so you see what happens is after the great disappointment, there is need for prophecy. After the great disappointment, that is not the end of everything. In fact, there is something else that they were instructed that you must do something after the great disappointment. And uh, for students of Bible history and uh, students of history, you'll understand that after the great disappointment, Hiram Edison and a friend were walking in the cornfield the next day, disappointed and dejected at the failure of the Lord to come. And as they were walking in the cornfield, then is when they remembered, wait, the Lord showed Hiram Edison in the skies open and he, and he saw the, 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 the picture of the sanctuary in heaven, the most holy place in heaven. And then they went back to do a study to understand, could it be that the sanctuary to be cleansed was not the earth as is popularly referred to? You see, this is uh, basically the danger of uh, going by what people say. It's, it's always good and safe for us to study the word for ourselves. I've, I've always said the sons of Sceva will say we adjure you by, Paul, by, by Jesus whom Paul preaches. It, it's not good to believe in Jesus whom somebody else talks about. You need to have a personal experience with him. Quickly into today's, uh, the events of 1844. What was to happen? I, I, I would want to just uh, go through this with us as I, I, I handle a topic called the investigative judgment. Seeing that it's, it's good to know, is, is it necessary, is, is it a fact, is it something that is factual, that is taking place, or it is one of those things that we are just talking about. And so I, I, I feel we need to study something about the investigative judgment because 1844 without the investigative judgment becomes very difficult for us to talk, the investigative judgment. And, and as I go into the investigative judgment, I, I think it's, it's, it's also a good time for us to just have a view of what are some of these things. Because these are, these are actually fundamentals in uh, basic Adventism. We need to know something about investigative judgment. The term investigative judgment simply means there is a judgment that is being done, an investigation is being done, records are being looked at, and this is common. This is common. DCI do investigations as, as uh, they bring cases before court. And you know, in, uh, in, in a court case, there are uh, persons who are into play, and uh, we will explain why all these are important parts. I love this quotation from uh, the book Education, page 144, paragraph 5. It says, Against every evil doer, God's law utters condemnation. He may disregard that voice. He may seek to drown its warning, but in vain. It follows him. It makes itself hard. It destroys it, his peace. If unheeded, if the warning from God is unheeded. If the word of God is unheeded, it pursues him to the grave. It bears witness against him at the judgment, a quenchless fire. It consumes at last soul and body. There is a warning that God normally gives. God gives his law as a flying scroll that cannot be escaped, that cannot be ignored. God's laws are here to warn us and remind us that what you're doing is wrong. And in and, and the book of Mark chapter 8 verses 36 and 37 says, what shall, a man, what shall it profit a man? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This is just to remind us that we reap what we sow. The Bible is clear. Galatians 6, 7, and 8 says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he reap. The reaping testifies to the sowing. And if, if we reap the wrong things, 
we will definitely, if we sow the wrong things, we'll definitely reap those things. And, and so God's law is somewhere. And the law of God is there to remind us of several things. Why? Because we have this life to live. But after this, there is something else. In fact, all of us know that death is imminent. And, and, and this has become so clear with uh, the COVID situation and all that. But I love Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. In Hebrews 9, 27, it says, As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. It is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. There is a judgment. Death forever closes our life's account. But before your life's account is closed, ask yourself, what does your life's record show? Too many of us have big plans for the future. While it is not wrong to plan for the future, but what does your life record show? If we were to die, what will be in our life's record? And, and that is what we are supposed to reflect on. But first things first, there are things we need to understand. We need to be brought to the picture of, of certain things. And, and, and that is what I would want to speak about briefly. Let me talk about this one. In Great Controversy, page 488, paragraph 2, it says these solemn words. Those who will share the benefits of the Savior's mediation. Remember we said that 1844, there's an event that happened. Rather than Christ come onto earth in 1844, Christ went into the most holy place in the heavenly sanctuary. But you see, what did he go to do in the most holy place? Now, he went to take part in the activity of the day of atonement. And to 2300 days, and then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. The cleansing of the sanctuary was done on the day of the atonement when the high priest went into the most holy place. I will get into that. But then that tells us something. We need to understand what Jesus is doing for us currently. Great Controversy 488, paragraph 2 says, Those who will share the benefits of the Savior's mediation should permit nothing to interfere with their duty to perfect holiness in the fear of God. Let's perfect holiness in the fear of God. The precious hours, instead of being given to pleasure, to display, or to gain seeking, should be devoted to an earnest, prayerful study of the word of truth. We should spend time studying the word of truth. In fact, the messenger to the remnant goes ahead to say, the subject of the sanctuary and the investigative judgment should be clearly understood by the people of God. All need a knowledge for themselves of the position and the work of their great high priest. Otherwise, it will be impossible for them to exercise the faith which is essential at this time or to occupy the position which God designs for them to fill. We need to understand the sanctuary. We need to understand the investigative judgment. And let me tell you, even for those who don't believe that there is a sanctuary, even for those who don't believe there is an investigative judgment, we need to study and prove that there is no investigative judgment. In fact, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that all of us will believe in this. Some of us will not believe in this. But let me tell you, even for those who are not going to believe in the investigative judgment. That's what I'm saying. We must be able to come to the point where we are able to clearly say there is no investigative judgment. And an investigative judgment is it's a concept that is very clear. Even for reason purposes, you understand there must be an investigative judgment. For if the Bible will say in the book of Revelation 22 that behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me to give to every man according to as his work shall be. How shall he come to reward if he did not judge? How do you give somebody first class if there was no exam? So let me tell you, we can argue and you can win the argument that there is no investigative judgment. But let me tell you something. You are undergoing investigative judgment, whether you win the argument or not. And here we are not doing denominationalism. It's not about denominations. Whether you want to agree to it or not, there is a judgment that is going on. Because when Jesus is coming the second time, that is not the time when he's coming to judge. He is coming to pick those who have been accounted worthy, the Bible 
is replicated everywhere. The Bible talks about those who will be accounted worthy to receive that, that resurrection. And th this is in the Gospels. Jesus himself says that they that will be accounted worthy of the resurrection, accounted worthy. Oh, no. Preacher, read, read it. I've, 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 I've had to just go to this so that I, I make the point clear that you need to be accounted worthy of the resurrection. In fact, this is uh, Jesus talking um, talking to them. And, and when Jesus is, is, is talking to them in, in the gospel, Jesus is, is speaking to people who are uh, doubting, who are doubting uh, what God can do. And, and so for that reason, he meets the Sadducees, those who did not believe in the resurrection. And as he meets the Sadducees, the Sadducees have a number of questions to ask. And some of the questions that the Sadducees are asking are concerning resurrection and such. And, and so Jesus, in seeking to speak to them and make them clearly understand this, begins to speak to them concerning the kingdom of heaven. And he begins to tell them that you need to understand that in heaven there shall be no marrying or giving in marriage. There are people who will make it to heaven. But before they make it to heaven, they must be judged by the actions they had when they were on earth. The inspired writing says, every individual has a soul to save or a soul to lose. Each has a case that is pending at the bar of God. Each must meet the great judge. And let me tell you, we are going to meet the great judge face to face. How important then it is that every mind contemplate often on the solemn scene when the judgment shall sit, the books shall be opened. When David, when Daniel, sorry, with every individual must stand in his lot at the end of the days. Remember we say Daniel will stand in his lot. But let me tell you, at the time of the judgment, Daniel must stand in his lot and you must stand in your lot. Because there is a judgment that is going on. And let me tell you, in this judgment, things are serious. He gave them the example using the sanctuary themes. And the sanctuary themes were very clear. If you can see in the illustration that I have shared with us, in, in the sanctuary theme, it was so clear that you must come with a lamp. And you can see the man in blue is coming with a lamp. When you have sinned, you must come with a lamp. You don't come into the sanctuary, into the presence of the Lord, without the lamp that is going to stand for you. Any person who came into the sanctuary without a lamp and he was a sinner, it was assumed that you want to offer yourself as a sacrifice. So the lamb came as a substitute for you because without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. The book of Hebrews will say so. And you can see the man in, uh, in red and green who is confessing his sins on the head of the lamb. And symbolically, this man's sins are transferred from him to the lamb. Let me give us a text. In Leviticus chapter 1, reading from verses 4 and 11, it explains this concept very clearly. And uh, it, it is a concept that we all need a clear understanding of. Leviticus 4.1 makes it very clear how the ministration was done. In Patrick's and Prophets 3.54, paragraph 2, it says the most important part of the daily ministration was the service performed in behalf of individuals. The repentant sinner brought his offering to the door of the tabernacle. And placing his hand upon the victim's head, he confessed his sins and thus in figure transferring them from himself to the innocent sacrifice by his own hand. The animal was then slain and blood was carried by the priest and sprinkled into the holy place before the veil, behind which was the ark containing the law which the sinner had transgressed. By this ceremony, the sin was transferred through the blood in figure to the sanctuary. In some cases, the blood was not taken into the holy place, but the flesh was to be eaten by the priests, as Moses had directed the sons of Aaron, saying, God hath given you to bear the iniquity of the congregation. That is in Leviticus chapter 10, verse 17. These two ceremonies both symbolize the transfer of sin from the penitent to the sanctuary. You are asking, why do we need the cleansing of the sanctuary? Because every day, sins were being transferred into the sanctuary. And at the end of the year, day of atonement, 
we needed to cleanse the sanctuary of all the sins that had been transferred. And so, with, with this event, we are having the high priest coming on a daily basis, ministering in the holy place. Where we had the candlestick, the altar of incense, the table of the shoe bread. In the holy place, the high priest will come daily. But once every year, the high priest would go to the most holy place. There was a veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. And when you got to the most holy place, you could see the, the, the Shekinah glory was on top of the mercy seat. And on top of this mercy seat, when the priest came to burn incense, he would burn incense on this front side of the veil. But there was a space between the veil and the roof of the tabernacle. And then this will go up, and as the incense goes up, there will be a sh the, the, the bright light, the glory of the presence of the Lord will light on the other side, and you'll know the Lord has accepted our sacrifice. But this was done every day, but there was another ministry which was done once every year. But what was the sanctuary service? What was the sacrificial system about? It was meant to remind us that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. The event of the ages cast its shadow before the sacrificial system. The cross where it stood was showing that the sacrificial system was a shadow of things to come. Jesus was the ultimate. That is why when you read in Colossians chapter 2 verses 17, it makes it clear that these things were a shadow of things to come. The ceremonial services were a shadow of things to come. And that is why when Jesus died upon the cross, he said it is finished. No, no, no. No need again. You don't need to offer lambs. The, the sanctuary service, the entire sanctuary service was to impress humanity with the greatest truth of all times that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. That's why the sanctuary service was given. Sanctuary service is not about killing animals. Sanctuary service is not about bringing goats and bringing cows and bringing lambs. Sanctuary service is a reminder that salvation is only through Jesus. That's why I said, if you don't have the lamb, you will die for your sins. And that is why it says in, in John chapter 1 verse 29, Behold the lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. Behold, lamb of God. And that is why Jesus, when he said, it is finished, the curtain of the temple was torn into two by a hand which was unseen. And it is said, when you go and check the historical records and everywhere where this event is captured, it says very clearly that on the day when Jesus died at three o'clock, there was an animal that was going to be sacrificed at the temple. And when the priest was about to sacrifice this animal, the curtain was rent into two. And the renting of the curtain into two, then the animal escaped. Symbolically showing that we are also freed by this sacrificial system. When he said it is finished, what did he mean is finished? It is finished. It means this sacrificial system is finished. And that it is finished, he didn't just say it then. He can say it in your life. When things are difficult for you in life, he simply needs to come in and remind you it is finished. I died upon the cross so that you can have victory over sin. It is finished. He said, I died on the cross so that you can be able to be healed. That's why the Bible will say in the book of Isaiah, by his stripes, we are healed. When Jesus was going through Calvary, going through Golgotha, he was being beaten and the stripes were upon him. Forty stripes and his body was lacerated and bleeding everywhere. But the text had said he was led as a sheep to the slaughter. He did not complain. But remember, by his stripes we are healed. Why am I not so much worried about COVID? Because by his stripes we are healed. He's, he's more than these diseases. He can be able to handle the situations that overwhelm us. That is what he's saying. And let me tell you, the sacrificial system, the old covenant of killing animals was coming to an end because the ultimate one, the Lamb of God, was crucified. When the Lamb of God was crucified, 
crucified. But let me tell you, we are talking about the sanctuary. Why are we talking about the sanctuary? Because, as I told you earlier, this was the point where, in 1844, a challenge came. They misinterpreted the sanctuary to mean the earth as the sanctuary. Please don't go by popular interpretations when you are doing your Bible study. Go by what the Bible says and ask God for an illumination of your mind and for the guidance of the Holy Spirit. The Bible says that when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. He will bring to remembrance whatsoever things I have taught you. So let's ask the Holy Ghost to give us a clearer understanding of the truths that God has for us in these last days. And I read this text. I see that God wanted something for us. But in 1844, it was believed that there was a day of atonement for the world. It was believed that, th that this was going to be the day of the destruction of the world. But it was to mark the start of the investigative judgment. And that is why we need to really such surely we should be so clear in what we are looking at and looking for let me say something on the light of the sanctuary the hour of god's judgment investigative judgment was beginning and men didn't know it men didn't know that they're going to be judged in fact let me read something from the book of Daniel chapter 7, reading from verses 13. If you go and read it, you will hear about coming unto the ancient of days. And, and let me explain this from the quotation in Great Controversy, page 479, paragraph 3. It says, the coming of Christ here described in Daniel chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, is not his second coming to the earth. When we are talking of he came to the ancient of days, that was not his second coming to the earth. He comes to the ancient of days in heaven to receive dominion and glory and a kingdom which will be given to him at the close of his work as a mediator. Get this clearly. The kingdom will be given at the close of his work as a mediator. If you want to understand the sounding of the seventh trumpet, and this also needs to be clear because in Revelation chapter 11, let me just make it a bit clear in revelation chapter 11 you are going to hear in revelation 11 reading from verses 15 it says and the seventh angel sounded and there were great voices in the heaven saying the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our lord and of his christ and he shall reign forever and ever the kingdoms do not become jesus kingdom in 1844 what is described in Daniel chapter 7 is not in 1844 the seventh trumpet began to sound. No, no, no. The kingdoms will be given to him at the close of his work as a mediator. And so when you're talking about the sounding of the seventh angel, remember we had said in Revelation chapter 10 verses 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God shall be finished. When it begins to sound, the mystery of God should be finished. I, I, don't, I don't know about you. I, I go chronologically by the things I have just studied. But I see Daniel, uh, Revelation 10, 7 says, when it begins to sound, mystery of God should be finished. When I go to Daniel chapter 7, it says, he came to the ancient of days. Great controversy clarifies that he comes to the ancient of the days in the heaven to receive. He comes to receive, but he does not receive the kingdoms until the close of his work as a mediator. Has Jesus finished his work as a mediator? Not yet. But when he finishes his work as a mediator, the seventh angel shall sound. And... In Great Controversy 479, paragraph 3, it says, It is this coming and not his second advent to the world that was foretold in the prophecy that was to take place at the termination of the 2300 days in 1844. Attended by heavenly angels, our great high priest enters into the Holy of Holies, and there he appears in the presence of God to engage in the last acts of his ministration in behalf of man to perform the work of investigative judgment, to make an atonement for all who are shown to be entitled to its benefits. 
All those who are to shown that they are entitled to the benefits of the investigative judgment will take part in the investigative judgment. Now listen to this. Jesus, oh no, I should have started this way. Did Jesus have to come on earth? Yes. Did Jesus have to go back to heaven? Yes. Because, listen, the, the, the work of the Jewish calendar, when you are looking at the process of the cleansing of your sins in the Jewish calendar, in the ancient times, it was not done completely on the day when you offer the lamb. When you offer the lamb, you are beginning the process. The process ends at the day of atonement when the high priest goes and takes all the sins that have been confessed through the spiritual year and he takes all these sins and he puts them on the head of the scapegoat. We are going to get to that. And when he puts them on the head of the scapegoat, that marked the end of the spiritual year. And that is why when you look at the great feast, we had the feast of the trumpets and then we had the Feast of the Day of Atonement and we had the Feast of the Tabernacles. Feast of the Tabernacles were coming afterwards. Why? Because they were celebrating that they have been forgiven their sins. Feast of the Tabernacles comes after. You celebrate not before, but afterwards. Graduation is always after. <laughs> That's why... You, you, you go for honeymoon after the wedding, not before the wedding. And, and, and so, when, when you look at this, the feasts, the, the, the feasts that were given, these feasts were pointing to something. And let me tell you, if Jesus came and he died on the cross, he would have done what we call the Passover, but he would not have gotten us to the Day of Atonement. If Jesus would have just finished with Pentecost, he would have done the Feast of the Weeks, but he would have not gotten. And, and let me tell you, the Day of Pentecost marks Jesus' entry to begin this service. In the holy place and he gets into the holy place in heaven we have an high priest who has ascended into heaven he goes to the high place to, to, to the holy place in heaven but goes to the most holy place in 1844 to begin the work of investigative judgment is this work important yes this work is very important you ask me i say absolutely it is a very important work that he went to do Important in what wise? Because the question is, who is going to take part in this investigative judgment? Yes, preacher, you're saying it's important. But who is taking part in this important investigative judgment? I get us to that. Who takes part in the investigative judgment? Not everyone that says that me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven. In the typical service, only those who came before God with confession and repentance and whose sins through the blood of the sin offering were transferred into the sanctuary had a part in the service at the Day of Atonement. So in the great day of final atonement and investigative judgment, the only cases considered are those of the professed people of God. The judgment of the wicked is a distinct and separate work and it takes place at a later period. When you read in Revelation, Chapter 20, you're going to talk about, I saw the books were open. Judgment of the wicked takes place afterwards. Oh, let me explain. You see, the investigative judgment is for the professed people of God, but the wicked will be judged afterwards because rejecting God is a judgment in itself. You've already condemned yourself. The fact that you've refused to accept Jesus, it means on the day of atonement, if you did not bring an animal in the course of the year so that your sins are transferred to the sanctuary, it means that you are willing to stand for your sins. And so, on the day of atonement, you are going to be cut off. That's what the Bible says. They were cut off from Israel, those who had not confessed their sins by the day of atonement. Well, let me explain. Day of Atonement begins first with the house of God. It begins first with God's children. In the book of First Peter chapter 4 and reading from verses 17, it says this, For 
The time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. And if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not the gospel of God? Listen to that. Judgment must begin with the house of God. And the question is, let me tell you, if you're not part of the house of God, this question should sober you up. If judgment must begin with the house of God, if it must first begin with us, what shall be the end of those who don't obey the gospel of God? You can say, I'm my own boss. But what shall be your end? And listen, it says in verses 18, And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and sinner appear? If even the righteous are going through the investigative judgment, and not even all of them they are scarcely saved. What about the ungodly? I mean, that, that question is rhetoric. The answer is obvious. It's worse for them. And, and so that is meant to sober us up, to make us try and think. Time is ticking away. And let me tell you, as time is ticking away, our records will come. And the books will be open. There are books of records. Let me tell you, in the judgment, what is used are books of records. There are books that have recorded our actions. There are books that have recorded the things that we've done. There are books that have recorded our standing. These books are there. And let me talk about the books. There's one book called the Book of Life. There's another book called the Book of Remembrance. And there's a book of the records of sin or the book of death. Let me talk of these three books quickly. In Great Controversy 480, paragraph 2, it says, The books of record in heaven, in which the names and deeds of men are registered, are to determine the decisions of the judgment. These books are to determine the decisions of the judgment. Decisions of the judgment are based on the books. That is why you find that even in earthly circles, courts make decisions based on the charges and what is recorded in the books. The decisions of the judgment are based on the books. And that makes me want to have a closer look into some of these books. Let's Let's quickly run through the books. Let me start with the book of life. At least if we don't, if we don't have a proper chronological latitude, book of life is very important. It's better to know whether we are in the book of life so that even if time cuts us short, at least you found yourself in the book. Book of life. Let me talk quickly about this one. Book of life. Whose name is the book of life? Quickly. Great Controversy 480 paragraph 3 explicitly states the book of life contains the names of all who have ever entered the service of God. That's what Great Controversy explicitly says. Now let me give you the biblical account. You see, if you read in the book of Revelation, this is the Revelation chapter is 13. Commonly read for the mark of the beast. But let's read Revelation chapter 13 verse 8. It says, And all that dwell on the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. The lamb was slain for our sins. If we are not going to accept the lamb, our names will not be in the book of life. And, and this is very critical. Because we need to have our names in the book of life. All who have once entered into the service of God, accepted Jesus as your personal savior, name in the book of life. Luke chapter 10 verse 20, talking about the disciples, when the disciples came after an evangelistic, and let me tell you, evangelism is good. They came after an evangelistic uh, uh, series and, and they were happy and excited. And Jesus tell them, notwithstanding, Luke 10, 20, notwithstanding, rejoice not in this that the Spirit has subject unto you, but rather rejoice that your names are written in heaven. If your name is not in the book of life, it is a sad thing. You should rejoice. What should make you happiest is that your name is recorded in the book that is in heaven. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, and reading from verses 3, it says, 
And I entreat you also, true York fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. There are people whose names are in the book of life. This is known. If you read in the book of Daniel chapter 12, this one we read the other day, and, and Daniel chapter 12, as, as we are talking of Daniel 12 from verses 1, it says, And at that time, Michael shall stand, the great prince that stand for the children of thy people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. And at that time, thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. And they that shall be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn men to righteousness are the stars forever and ever. Makes it clear that there is a book where people's names are recorded. Revelation 21. I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to put emphasis on this book because we need to have our names in this book. In Revelation 21, 27, it says, and there shall no wise enter into it any that anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or make it a lie. But they that are written in the Lamb's book of life, listen, your name must be written in the Lamb's book of life before Jesus comes. This is the time for our names to be written in the Lamb's book of life. In fact, in the book Faith I Live By, Page 210, paragraph 7, it says, If your name is registered in the Lamb's book of life, then all will be well with you. Be ready and anxious to confess your faults and forsake them, that your mistakes and sins may go. That your mistakes and sins may go beforehand to the judgment and be blotted out. Listen to what Christ says to the overcomer. In the book Historical Sketches to Foreign Missions of the Seventh-day Adventists, page 138, paragraph 6, it says, Christ says of the overcomer, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. The names of all who have once given themselves to God are written in the book of life, and their character are now passing in review before him. Angels of God are weighing moral worth. Listen to this. They are watching the development of character in those who are living to see if their names can be retained in the book of life. If their names can be retained, meaning your name can be written and it can be blotted out. Let's substantiate that. In the book of Exodus, our wonderful friend is called Moses. Names can be written and names can be blotted out. Moses, give us the lesson. Listen to this. The Bible says in the book of Exodus 32, 30, 29, For Moses has said, Consecrate yourselves to the day to the Lord, even every man upon his own son, upon his brother, that he may bestow upon you a blessing this day. And it came to pass on the morrow that Moses said to the people, You have sinned a great sin. I will now go up to the Lord, and peradventure I shall make an atonement for your sin. And Moses returned to the Lord and said, Oh, these people have sinned a great sin, and they have made gods of gold. Yet now, if thou wilt not forgive their sins, if thou wilt forgive their sin, if not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. And the Lord said unto Moses, Whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. God blots out of the book those who have sinned against him. Names are to be retained. We must do everything necessary that our names may be retained. In fact, in historical sketches to foreign missions, page 138, paragraph 6, it says, A probation is granted us in which to wash our robes of character and make them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who is doing this work? This is a question. Who is separating himself from sin and selfishness in this era of Instagram? Who is separating himself? Ye are dead, says the Apostle Paul to the followers of Christ. And your life is hid in Christ. When we are alive to God, we are dead to self. May God help us to die to self. Whose names will not be blotted out of the book of life. Only the names of those who have loved God with all the powers of their beings and their neighbors as themselves. 
those are the only ones whose names will not be blotted out. We are living in perilous times. We are living in tough times. And it will be best for us to really be careful that our names may be retained and not blotted out. Why do I say this? I say this because we are a judgment-bound people living in the hour of judgment, in the hour of God's judgment. Revelation chapter 14 and reading from verse 6 has already said this. And, and I like the way Revelation 14, 6 puts it. This is where I want to put an end to today's session. Revelation 14, 6. It says, and I read, and I saw another angel flying in the midst of the heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. Let me ask you, where did you hear that again? Didn't you hear that in Revelation chapter 10 verses 11 when he says, Thou must prophesy again to every nation and tongue and people and kings. Again here, another angel comes with a loud voice. These angelic messages are not to be ignored. The angel says with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory for the hour of his judgment is come. Worship him that made the heaven and the earth and the, sea and the fountains. Where did you hear that again? Was it in Revelation chapter 10? When we read in Revelation chapter 10 and reading from verse 6 where he says, And he swear by him that liveth forever and ever, who created the heaven and the things that are therein, the earth and the things that are therein, the sea and the things that are therein, that there should be time no longer. When he was saying there should be no more time prophecy beyond this 2300 we are dealing with, there is no more time prophecy. But listen, he says, there should be time no longer. But when he's saying that, remember, there the creator is brought into picture. And here in the first angel's message, the creator is the, the, the creator is brought into picture once again. Book of Life. In which are written the names of people who have entered into the service of God. People who have given their lives to to God. How I wish that we will give our lives to God. That we will decide that God, here I am, use me. That we would desire to see a development of character in ourselves. Development of character is the key word. You know, Christ sits somewhere and watches. Oh, I have a young one. I have two young kids. I've, I've come to understand something about development of character. Development is a key word. When you have a young one like I have, every single thing counts. You should see the joy I have when my little born son has added 300 grams in one week. So much joy. When he adds 500 grams like he did the other week, I, I was over myself. I couldn't, I, I, I couldn't keep quiet. I just wanted people to know my son has added 500 grams. And, and let me tell you something. That is me watching the development of my son. And I'm excited about him adding a few pounds of flesh. Having been born at 2 kilograms. Lost weight went to 1.8. And, and now I can see him adding 400 grams per week. And, and I can see him. He, he gets to 2.6. I'm excited. He gets to 3 kilograms. I'm excited. You know why? Because that is progress. Let me tell you, our Savior is watching somewhere for those who have once entered into his service. He's watching for those who've accepted him as their personal Savior. He's watching for those who've accepted him and he's written their name in the book of life. He's watching for the development of character. Oh, my kids have been born and, and I'm closing with the story of my kids. I, I love them. Everyone who knows me knows that. I love my kids. My kids have suddenly been born, both of them, into ICU. 
Bond came into this world, went directly into ICU. And I spent, uh, I've, I've spent some time in neonatal ICU and seen kids develop there. And I have come to know something about watching development. Because when the kids are in that ICU, you watch them and when every single day counts, when they lose weight, you get worried. When the breathing is not proper, you get worried. When they cannot be able to feed well, you get worried. But let me tell you, don't you think God is watching his children who've accepted him, his children who are newborn babes, and he's watching for the development of character. And he's, he's almost getting worried when we are losing weight. When our spiritual weight is, is found wanting, God is getting worried. He's watching for the development of character. He does not want invalids. He does not want people who are lame. He wants his children not to be lame sacrifices. He wants perfect sacrifices. He wants those who are excellent and wonderful. And that's why in Romans chapter 12, he will say, render your bodies a living sacrifice unto the Lord. Living sacrifice. He doesn't want weak, dying sacrifices. He wants living sacrifices. Those who have once entered into the service of the Lord, those whose names are written in the book of life, God has put them under the radar. Close supervision. He's watching for the development of character in them. And their character is passing in review before the Lord. And the Lord is checking if we will be retained in the book of life. I will continue from there in tomorrow's session as you continue to study about these wonderful truths of the investigative judgment. Truths that came as a result of the disappointment of 1844 when everyone was looking to the coming of Jesus and yet Jesus was beginning a glorious work. A work that requires the reflection of each and every one of us. I know too many of us who are Seventh-day Adventists take these things for granted. We don't even care. We are, we are like, ah, oh, no, it's investigative judgment. We've known it. But it's good for us to study these things again. And remember, God is watching for development of character. God is having our character passing in review before him. Why? Because investigative judgment involves checking the records. May God help us. Those of us who've never given our lives to Jesus, may God help us that we may be convicted to give our lives to Jesus so that we can be part of this investigative judgment. Those of us who've given our lives to Jesus, God help us that we may develop character, that we may be able to stand when our names are passing in review before him in the investigative judgment. May God bless us through as we continue with our studies that we may be able to reflect on these things. Remember, Moses said, blot out my name. God said, only those who sinned against me will I blot. Tomorrow, I think I need to deal with aspects like once saved, always saved. And uh, we will be able to talk about that. But for today, I am talking about book of life. Give your life to Jesus. You need to start a walk with Jesus. Remember, the lamb, you had to come with the lamb. Accept Jesus so that you can enter into the sanctuary message with him, with the Lamb. You can go whithersoever the Lamb goeth, that you can be able to enter into the most holy place, that God can be able to say that I am speaking about your sins which you've confessed. You need the Lamb to represent you. If you don't have the Lamb, It's condemnation. John chapter 3, reading from verses 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. I love that. In fact, when you hear John talking about this, he, he, develops, he develops the theme so well that God did not send the, world, the, the Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through the Son might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned. 
But she that believeth not is condemned already. That's what I was telling you. If you don't have the lamb, you are already condemned. That's why your name is not written in the book of life if you don't have the lamb. The lamb is your ticket to the book of life. It means you want life. You want life eternal. He that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world. But men have loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. The condemnation is not that Jesus didn't come. The condemnation is that she came, but men have loved darkness rather than light. May God help us that we may be able to accept him and live by his every word is my prayer this evening. Let's pray. Lord, bless us, guide us, the challenges that we face in our lives, forgive us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that in a special way you talk to us of the book of life. You tell us that we should not even rejoice in evangelistic success, but we should rejoice that our names are written in heaven because God, this is the best that we need to have. And I pray, Heavenly Father, all who will get to hear this message, Heavenly Father, may be convicted, not even to reflect on the doctrines, but to really reflect on whether their names are recorded in the book of life. God, it's so important for us to have our names written in the book of life. It's more important to have our names retained in the book of life. So God bless us as we make commitments with you to live godly, May you guide us throughout. It's my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Lord bless you all. The Lord keep you all safe.